Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this uh, Engage event, our regular uh, event, which we uh, throughout which we discuss various uh, issues. And tonight's topic is biodiversity and local action. Biodiversity has been uh, in the media and generally in the public domain. Uh, recently quite uh, regularly and so we thought that it would be great to discuss what is happening already locally and what can happen and what needs to happen so i'm delighted that uh three uh people in, in involved in uh in work uh, uh with biodiversity uh has joined, have joined me tonight it's uh john watson uh fern arnold and Ian Jelly, and I'll let them uh, introduce themselves in a second. I'll just reiterate that this session is recorded and is going to be uploaded on YouTube, so you will be able to uh, view the session again and share this link with others uh, if you uh, feel like doing so. <coughs> I encourage you to use uh, chat facilities uh, as much as you can to interact with the speakers, to interact with you, uh, between yourselves, and to ask questions. Uh, Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Chilvers will be monitoring uh, the chat. And when we get to the uh, Q&A session, uh, we will be able to uh, ask your questions on your behalf. So please, please do use uh, chat facilities uh, to make this session as interactive as possible. Uh, but we'll kick start with uh, introductions. So uh, in no particular order, uh, I have John Watson uh, first on my screen. So if you could unmute yourself and just say a few words about you, just your work uh, and whatever you feel like saying at this stage. Thank you. Okay, okay. Can everyone hear okay? Yeah, um, yeah I'm John, John Watson. Um, I'm a Green Party member. I live in Kenilworth. Um, I'm also, uh, I, I volunteer with quite a few bits and bobs in Kenilworth, principally um, the Kenilworth Arts Festival. Um, um, I've got an allotment, um, I see one or two other allotment here faces there. Um, the allotment is a big part of my life and the side that of the river that my allotment is on is lots of people are really into uh, nature ecology biodiversity it's something that uh, gives me a lot um, in my personal life uh, the allotment um yeah so i live in kenilworth i've got four children they're all grown up they're all doing their own thing and i'm just trying to um just trying to have as best a time as, as i can in kenilworth and and also put as much value ecologically as I can into the local environment. That's about it for me. Super, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Fern Arnold, Fern, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, I'm gonna be talking about Be Friendly Kenilworth and I'm gonna give you an introduction to myself uh, and Be Friendly Kenilworth. And um, I'm going to be speaking for a few minutes, so I hope that's okay. Um, so hello and thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm Fern and I've been resident in Kenilworth for 18 years, which is now the longest I have ever lived anywhere after many house and job moves. Uh, during the time in Kenilworth, I've been a stay at home mum. Uh, throughout my adult life, I've always volunteered in some capacity, but when I had children, it was with the PTA and once they left school I started volunteering at a local charity shop in the stockroom. Um, at the beginning of lockdown, uh, after asking my local councillor if the verge next to my house could be left unmown during no mow may and what the procedure was for dealing with that, um, I was invited by James Kennedy and Alex Deering to join a group of like-minded people um, who got together during lockdown uh, to discuss biodiversity. Uh, at the start, this group included uh, many Greentown councillors, so some of you will have already have, uh, seen me before, 
Um, so it, that included Kenilworth and Leamington. And after several meetings, much research and advice sought from organizations like Plant Life, Bug Life and others, uh, we decided to call ourselves Bee Friendly Kenilworth. We want to increase biodiversity for all pollinators, but thought bees were a good start. We needed some aims and objectives. And so um, I won't read them all out to you. Um, it goes without saying we want to increase, uh, improve biodiversity in the area. And we'd like to encourage people to leave areas of their garden left wild, uh, to work with both Work District Council and the County Council and also to work with local schools. And uh, one of our other aims was to become a bee town. Um, so what is a bee town? Um, last year, I heard about Monmouth. Uh, they declared themselves the first bee friendly town in Wales. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if we could be one of the first towns in England? Uh, they had been working on it for many years with other local community groups and they had a pilot project called Nature Isn't Neat. And they now host, or until lockdown, hosted Wales' only bee festival. Uh, I discovered that there's no set criteria for being a bee town, um, but uh, we've been working with the Bee Friendly Trust who in turn are working with DEFRA on coming up with some criteria. Uh, with the Bee Friendly Trust, we've also been working with three other towns. And we recently had a visit both from Luke who founded Bee Friendly Trust and from a leak town councillor, Bill. And uh, I'm pleased to say they were very happy with the visit to Kenilworth where we all walked around together. Um, there are, however, lots of towns and cities across the country who are working together on similar goals who are also supported by groups like Plant Life and Bug Life. Although we are a green group, we would want to be as non-partisan as possible and involve as many locals as possible. We have spread the word about us during Kenilworth's Nature Watch Week and more recently at em Leamington's EcoFest, where we had a lot of interest and signed up 49 new members. Kenilworth is a great town to live in and we are fortunate to have many green areas. The council's contractors already leave areas wild in parks and we want to work with them to increase this. After discussion with Wark District Council last year, we agreed on five pilot areas of amenity grass in the Park Hill area of Kenilworth for reduced mowing, which allows us to see what wildflowers are already in the soil, uh, allow them to grow and to help feed pollinators. In future, we hope to do some planting and to sow wildflower seed. There are currently no road verges in the trial, as although these are mown by Wark to Council, they are owned by the County Council. This is something that the County Council has been looking at and we have had some discussion with them, but I'm afraid that is taking a bit of time. Uh, Wark District Council have been supportive, but they have to take on board the opinions of all residents and also to spend taxpayers' money wisely. It's from this part pilot, we can learn what we need to do as we would like to expand into Leamington and Warwick, which we hope to do next year. Uh, during our pilots, there have been some complaints, but they've mostly been due to communication issues between um, us and the residents and also between Warwick District Council and their contractors. Uh, at the beginning of this, we thought we had cracked communication in that we had put, uh, there was an article in the local paper, it was in the local green newsletter that is distributed throughout Kenilworth. And once we had agreed on areas, we then leafleted all the houses that directly fronted onto these areas. But still some residents had said that they had not been consulted. We need to learn from this. Two of the areas that uh, were mown early after complaints, but we engaged with the local residents and hopefully left things on a good note. It's too long a story to go into now, uh, but some of the complaints were due to delaying with mowing throughout Kenilworth caused by issues with the contractors. Uh, they had some technical difficulties with some new mowing equipment. And unfortunately, it meant that both Be Friendly Kenilworth and the Green Party got some blame from that. And it shows that communication is key. 
There are already voluntary groups in Kenilworth that we are involved with. For example, um, I'm involved with John on the uh, flower beds in Townsman Square. And um, I've also um, been finding out about the planting at Kenilworth Station. All these improvement, all these improve Kenilworth and make it an attractive place to live, work and visit. These initiatives are low cost, but benefit many and can attract tourists. It shows what individuals and small groups can achieve. The verge next to my house, which is where it all started, has now had two summers of not being mown. And although it does show that nature isn't neat, it has also fed many pollinators with red and white clover, knapweed, daisies, buttercups, bird's foot trefoil, oxide daisy, and many grasses. So I would like to spread the message to all towns being pollinator friendly and also expand cooperation between the groups in town that have a similar message. Also, that although I have done and continue to do a lot of volunteering, in the past, I had always stayed in the background, but with the combination of lockdown and the climate crisis, it's forced me to put myself forward in a way that I've never had the courage to do before. I am now on Kenilworth Town Council's Climate Emergency Committee after being invited to talk to them and then invited to stay to do my small part to help the town. If I can do it, anyone can. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. It's wonderful. It all starts with a tiny, tiny bit of land and mm. grows into massive things. Thank you. Thank you, for Very inspirational. All right. Uh, Ian, could you ask you to introduce yourself, please? Thank you. Um, I'm not sure how I follow both of those. What an inspiring start to the evening. Uh, that's just brilliant and, and really um, helped me kind of be enthused about um, the future, actually. It could be quite depressing sometimes with the... Uh, the climate and ecological crisis we're facing and actually it's great to meet like-minded people who are genuinely making the difference. Um, I've got a few slides, it's not going to take me very long, I just want to um, picture sometimes tell a thousand words and you don't want to look at my face so let's uh, hopefully I'll share my screen and hopefully you can see that. Um, so I will rattle them through, they, uh, they only last 20 seconds per slide so I have to talk really quickly otherwise it moves on without me. So this is an introduction um, from me and the Wildlife Trust. So I work for the Wildlife Trust. I'm one of the directors there. And we've got a new vision that we're developing now that's looking to try and tackle the climate and ecological emergency. The charity was established back in 1970. And over the last five decades, we've secured uh, 65 nature reserves and engaged lots of people, um, helped safeguard some of the rarest wildlife and reintroduce some species that have previously been lost. We've got lots of supporters, but despite all that effort, it's not been enough. And, and as you guys all probably know, because you're on the call and you care, uh, pretty much every graph with nature looks like this. You don't have to be a maths expert to realise that if the graphs go down, it's not good. Uh, and this is the indicator for wildlife and biodiversity across the UK. Wildlife is in trouble, and if we don't do something, it will go extinct. In fact, 15% of all species in the UK are now under threat from extinction in our lifetime, which is a horrendous stat and something that I do not want to happen on my watch. There's a range of different factors for that, and they're all with a common thread that humans are behind them. But humans can also be the solution if we make the right behavioural choices. We're at a bit of a crossroads, really. Over the last five decades, the Wildlife Trust and others have been working hard to try and conserve nature but it's been gradually declining. And if we carry on doing what we've done for the last five decades, we will have extinctions. What we need to do is drastically ramp up the changes that we need to make, behavioral changes in society to make space for nature. So how do we set up to respond to the climate crisis? Well, the Wildlife Trusts nationally are championing a concept called 30 by 30. And the idea behind this is that 30% of the UK land and sea will support nature's recovery by 2030. And the great idea behind that is it's scalable. We could look at our patch. So these are the stats for the natural areas, the percentage of land contributing towards nature's to recovery in our area. And you can take any local authority like Rugby or Warwick District and see their stats. Overall, Warwickshire, Coventry and Side Hills at 13%. We're a long way to go if we want to get to 30 how are we going to try and instigate that change? Well, we launched our, our biggest ever fundraising appeal back in March. 
um, and some of you may have donated. And if you have, thank you very much. Uh, we are aiming to raise three million pounds to try and acquire land at scale that we've never done before. We want to try and buy a thousand new hectares of land to support nature's recovery. And this new land will go alongside our existing nature reserves to make more space for nature. And in doing that, we're also going to be engaging more people at scale because we realise that we can't own everything. We can't do it all ourselves. We need to take people on that journey with us, whether they be farmers or individuals in a local community. So the, the question we need to ask if we're trying to inspire people, is there a positive tipping point when you're trying to engage people, a point at which action leads to genuine change on the ground? We know that a lot of people care about the natural environment, but is that actually transforming into action? So we've seen some great case studies already from John and Fern talking about what they're passionate about. And actually the science suggests that if 25%, so one in four people start taking action, then things change. That, that science was tested with things like people stopping smoking, uh, changing behaviours around plastic use, and that can happen with biodiversity too. So for Team Wilder, as we're calling it, which is just the kind of the brand of everyone trying to take a, 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 a action for wildlife on their doorstep, it could be schools, it could be universities, businesses, councils, farmers, individuals, everyone doing a small thing in their area of life that can contribute collectively together. Put another way, if everybody plays their part and brings their piece of the jigsaw, we can all help mend the jigsaw, put it back together and support nature's recovery. Small actions really do add up. And, and, and the great thing is that small actions added up together in a structured way can be even better for wildlife and tackle the climate crisis. So in summary, what we're looking to try and achieve over the next 10 years is to get more people on nature's side which will create more actions for wildlife and result in more space for nature. We need to scale up our efforts and we're really keen to work with people on a bigger scale than we've ever done before. And I'd love to talk more about that tonight. Super, thank you very much. That's great, <laughs> very dynamic as well, super. Uh, John, uh, would you like to uh, add anything to your Intro or some, or I mean, I, I just read in the chat. I'm oh, sorry if you can unmute yourself. Yeah, I just introduced myself, um, but I'm happy to go now if that's okay. Yes, please. Okay. Um, yeah, um, before um, the lockdown, I'd been disenfranchised, disenchanted with my job um, working in car design uh, for a long time. And um, just before that, I'd managed to get a place at Warwick University uh, for a, a big car company. But again, I was just making the same old SUV shapes and it was starting to really depress me. So um, I was quite involved with the HS2 camp uh, up at Crackley Woods. I'd take them, um, uh, take them firewood and take them some food now and again. And um, just before, uh, I think it was just before the lockdown, there was a march. Uh, Boris Johnson was deciding whether to um, to go to press go with um, HS2, and I got a text about a big march from Cobbington, and I went to it, and I ended up drumming at the front of the march. Uh, I didn't know I was going to do this, and um, unbeknownst to me, it was filmed by. I knew there were cameras, but it was Sky, BBC, and Al Jazeera. So. Uh, Lots of people at work saw this. I told my line manager I'd gone to the dentist, a small white lie, uh, which he didn't like. Anyway, everyone got everyone. We we're all contractors. We all we all got the sack. And uh, to keep myself sane, I um, I just got stuck into my allotment. And um, <laughs> one of the thing I did, because I'm part of the arts festival, we had some money, uh, for, you know, in our little pot. But we had we couldn't do anything because of uh, social distancing, all that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, sorry about that. I don't know if that was me or somebody else. Uh, so we had some money, and we um, we started to build some. Uh, the bookshop at Talisman Square had already got some planting. They started it, and between the bookshop. Uh, Kenilworth Books and the flower shop, the Orangery, they got some wood together and I built some planters 
And also, because it was an art festival, we got some artwork that the sixth formers had done for us. And I managed to sneak that out of the sixth form and spirit it away. And we put it up. And it's slightly political, slightly environmental. There's a turtle nearly eating some plastic, but not quite. And some other bits and bobs of environmental stuff. And we started to fill the planters up. And we thought we'd... We started to get the, as many nice planting in it as much as we could, uh, principally to cheer up uh, the Kenilworth residents, principally within that group, the retired people that live in lots of the sheltered accommodation around uh, Kenilworth Town Centre. Uh, I have a bit, a bit of a sneaky um, ulterior motive for trying to do this. I was trying, in my, the back of my mind, I was trying to um, cheer the people of Kenilworth up so that they stop voting Conservative. I don't know if that's worked or not, but hopefully I, I live in optimism that that could be the case. So more and more people stopped to talk as we were planting, as we were watering and weeding. More and more people, lots of residents stopped and talked and expressed admiration. Um, um, more and more volunteers joined in. Um, it became a, a social event. Fern and myself and others, we... Um, we do a bit of wheat, uh, we, we weed and we water on a Friday evening and we, we often end up sharing a bottle of wine and having a nice social thing. So it's really nice um, social work event in itself. Um, so I've gained a lot uh, from losing my job and taking this direction from a voluntary basis. The other thing that happened to me from a really positive um, uh, thing was because I was so upset about the crackly wood devastation, I said to a friend of mine on the allotment, where can I go now? There's, the, you know, that's the little plank bridge in the Bluebell Wood where I used to walk my old sheepdog has gone. And I, I was too upset to go there. And he said, I'll oh, go to the, um, go to uh, Temple Balsall and you can pick wild garlic there. And the river's lovely. So that's what we did. And we ended up doing it twice a week. And it is absolutely glorious. Um, it's the Cuttle Brook, which is a tributary to the Blythe. And um, there's a natural burial ground there, which I used to park at. And I ended up chatting to this guy who was the warden. And I dropped a little note through saying what a great job that I thought they'd done. And the, the biodiversity is incredible there. The, the amount of dragonflies and butterflies, uh, this is last year, but also this year. Uh, it's just been incredible. And um, we, there's shoals of amazing little fish, which I, I, I couldn't identify. Uh, a Warwickshire Wildlife Trust planted some, they built these shoals to create some meanders a, a few years back. And in those meanders, there are apparently a brook char, which are a, a species that only thrive in really uh, clean water. So that's there. I expressed my admiration for the place and the owner, the guy who was the warden, has offered me his job. So I now, I've templated his role and I'm the caretaker manager of the place, totally, total left turn for me, um, career-wise. Uh, but I'm outdoors all the time, and I, I'm 80% a wildflower gardener, and 20% of the time, I meet the bereaved people and I arrange the, the, the day on the funeral. Uh, that we, we, we have natural burials there for full body, and we also have some ashes. Um, we I've spent all last um, autumn and winter planting trees, and, and putting wildflower seed. Um, and and it's it an epiphany in my life recently was that the next stage of say 15, 20 years maybe of me working has to have an intrinsic value. It can't just be about money. I haven't got that excuse. I don't have to, I can't blame my children for me being a slave to a, a wage slave in a design studio. So I can't do that anymore. I've got to take stock and have an intrinsic value. And I feel as if I've got that with the volunteering at Talisman Square um, and with this new role that I've got. Um, yeah, uh, lots of reading has uh, influenced me to this. Lots of, you know, famous writing, the, the nature writing, um, you know, the kind of um, Roger Deakin, Robert McFarlane. Uh, but a couple, I've just read this book. I'm going to plug it. Uh, won the, uh, the um, Wainwright Award. English Pastoral by James Redbanks. I uh, finished it really quickly. It's absolutely glorious. A book about biodiversity and, and 
ecological values. Um, that'll do for me. Anybody else? I'll hand back to Ignati. Wow. Gosh, again, from, from something I completely unexpected and small, suddenly all this uh, arises. It's incredible that small verge changed things for the fern and that certain small uh, appearance on TV <laughs> changed, changed your life to completely different and unusual things. So it's absolutely incredible. Uh, I think... I mean, you've answered quite a lot of questions which I've pre prepared for tonight, so, which is great. Uh, I was wondering if we come back maybe to Ian's presentation and, and, and uh, a slide there where you in, were talking about people being involved. So we've heard two stories now, you know, Jones and Ferns, but uh, maybe we can talk about what other actions, what, what other things people can do. Uh, without waiting for the government and without waiting for, for more funding, what can be done uh, uh, by individuals you know, who are present now and who will probably listen to us in the future? Um, Whoever would like to start? Ian, yeah? I can, I, can, I can say a few words. I think, so obviously I, I'm fortunate enough to, to be paid by a charity to work and I've got a, a background in the kind of ecological side of things. and. Um, that doesn't dissuade my uh, passion for doing it in volunteering, but I, I, I can appreciate the, the feeling when uh, people like John talk about wanting to do something, because it's great to work in a sector whereby everyone appears to be genuine and, you know, there's a lot of momentum behind stuff. And we often get asked, well, what can I do on my patch? And the, the presentation that I just gave you that whistle stop tour about, the, the, is a, a change coming from our charity as a result of not, achieving enough so you know we we have uh, you, the first thing we need to do is acknowledge everything that the charity has done over the last five decades because without the work of particularly the volunteers in the first instance we wouldn't have safeguarded the nature reserves and done a lot of the work that's been achieved and wildlife would be in a lot worse state but actually for us to reach that scale and the one in four people that i was talking about and to give an opportunity for one in four people to act what we need to do is make it easy for people and to give people opportunities that they can do that interest them. So the, the difference that we're gonna do as a charity moving forward is we are gonna be less precious about having to physically be involved with everything and try and inspire and engage people to do things just as Fern outlined by, by grabbing that kind of catalyst, that, that sort of passion to them locally that wants to make a difference. And as a charity, we've got a bit more resource than people working independently, so we can help signpost them. We're going to develop toolkits and guides and practical opportunities for people to meet other people, like-minded people, and try and act more effectively as facilitators to bring the likes of Fern and her group and other groups together without us having to brand it as a wildlife trust um, project. Um, just essentially knowing that through collective action and sharing of ideas, people can achieve more. So I think my, uh, my advice would be to people that are interested would be think about what motivates you and what you're interested in. What comes into your garden, your street? What do you talk to about with your neighbours? Is there an opportunity to do something like pollinator stuff like Fern has done, which, which is brilliant? Have you got hedgehogs in your patch? There's loads of stuff that people can do for hedgehogs. Things like that bring people together. And it's much better to feel like you've got a community of people doing it than people acting individually. And you can start that online. You can start that just through chatting to your neighbour. You can start that talking to family and friends or work colleagues. Find out where the, what the, the interest is in the local area, because all wildlife needs our help. And small actions add together to make a big difference. And some things make a difference to lots of lots of different things. You know, by by helping pollinators, you're also helping lots of other things further up the food chain. There's quite a few things eat pollinators. Um, so it's good to have the more pollinators we've got, then the more other wildlife we've got as well. That's my starter. I'll, I'll let then somebody else have a, have a have a say. Well, thank you. Fair, John, would you like to edit it? If you can unmute yourself, Fern, we can't see. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Huh? No. Just to say that I think that everybody can do something, however small. I, I don't think anything anything that you do isn't wasted. You know, if 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 you have an 
apartment, you can have a pot of lavender. You know, if you're fortunate, you've got a garden like me, then we try and plant wild flower and, and things that pollinators like. And, but it is very important to engage with people. When I um, first asked the contractors not to mow my verge, I made a point of talking to all my neighbors to check that they were on board. And I think because I explained what I was doing and why, they were very happy about it. I think if, I, if I'd have just left it, so I say it wasn't neat, it does, it can look messy at times. I think we would have had complaints, but because I explained it to people, and it was also quite nice that there's a little uh, verge between um, my driveway and my neighbors. And they said, oh, well, can you look after our bit as well? And so I've just thought it was nice that um, just by talking to people that you can get people involved. And, you know, I've been working with John at Talisman Square and sometimes if you do things on your own, it can be a bit of a chore, but because John and I and a group of other people do the gardening on a Friday, um, it actually becomes a pleasurable thing to do. We do a bit of weeding and, and you know, planting when it's needed, but we always stop for, stop for a chat. We stop with passerby because we get lots of comments uh, complimenting us, um, which makes you feel good. And um, then we stop and have a glass of wine. So um, what's not to like? So I think everybody could do something. It's just taking that first step. Fascinating. So it seems like it's, it's, it's uh, use uh, one transparent here that we should make it a social and pleasurable yeah. activity as much as uh, contributing to things. John, would you like to uh, to add anything here? Uh, yeah, okay. regarding the bee friendly Kenilworth and leaving the verges, um, I went and asked uh, about, well, I asked quite a lot of money. I, I asked about 13. One was he's got it immaculately clipped, his garden, and it's his passion and he, he didn't want to talk about it but 12 others in my street um they left they they didn't mow for me and um and it was it was a strange uh, it's been a strange year you know because um at the meadow where i work we had we had a really late frost and then it was really dry for the summer so all of the wildflowers they just got on with it really quickly and then bolted and it and it was um no mo may was a bit of a damp squib because it was too cold my whole front garden is is a wildflower uh, i never cut it i do uh, sickle around the edges a little bit but um it was a bit of a damp squib no mo may and then all of my neighbors the, the, the others except for next door they were out there on the on the first of june and obliterated everything and um and then the weather kicked in and all the wildflowers started to come again. So it's just a little bit, I, I don't think I won them over enough. I just felt they were uh, uh, communication, I think. Um, you know, I did say about um, biodiversity and, and stuff like that, but it was just, yeah, it's just slightly a damp squib because of the weather and the strange seasons I think we had early on in the, in the summer, in the late spring. Mm. Thank you. So I think, I mean, I have a few questions, but there are so many questions, so many comments in the chat, so I think we should really jump onto them, because uh, uh, they, they flow nicely from what we've discussed already. So uh, two questions from Juliet uh, Green and uh, in Davison, which are very similar. Uh, how can we maximize the rough places within towns and in the surroundings and stop the cleaning up, cutting and planting of pretty non-native plants? That's how Juliet worded her question. And Ian, I think it's along the same line, says, nature isn't neat, quoting Fern. Uh, I love it, says Ian, but what, to do, uh, what do you say to people who prefer neat, low-cut grass and pristine hedges? So how do we turn this obsession with neatness and cleanliness and uh, order? I, I wish I knew the answer. It, it's really hard. Um, when we were doing our pilots, we had some complaints about, um, about, particularly about one of the areas and some of them were, you know, 
very adamant that they like things really neatly mown and with some people you just can't complain that just can't change their minds but with other people I think once we explained a bit more about it um they were more amenable and I think if we're allowed to continue next year um I think we just have to learn how to um engage more with people I, th I think this year or you know and last year as well because of lockdown we couldn't really talk to people because I would have done some door knocking but because I didn't think that was possible um it made it hard but when we did get the complaints and lockdown was over and we were able to meet people on the site and talk to them and explain what we were trying to do um even though they still wanted mowing done they were agreeable to some compromises so i think some some of our areas were maybe a bit too big and if we'd have you know maybe thought well okay we'll do one end of a green area and not the whole area um it would have worked but unfortunately some people it doesn't because one of the complaints we had was um i've got asthma and the long grass is making it worse well we live in kenilworth which is a very green area um if grass affects you um and i, and I know with my son that is an issue as well um i don't really think you can blame it on a few areas of grass left long um so if anybody has any other ideas Mm, thank you. Um, there's a couple of thoughts from me. So we, we've got a couple of projects that we're working with, um, with, with different organisations. So we're working with Orbit Housing, a social housing provider at the moment, on the basis of this 30 by 30 idea. And that's quite useful for us because it, it gives us that tangible focus of saying, OK, it's not everywhere, it's just 30%. So let's look at how we can do 30%. And I think that's a useful starting point to say that, you know, we're not going to change everything overnight because there are some people that really like pristine gardens, but 30% is achievable if we get that momentum. And going back to the behavioural science that I was talking about, that is linked to things like changes in behaviour around plastics and things like that. Actually, if you can start to build up year on year, absolutely appreciate what John said. The weather wasn't doing us any favours this year and no mow may was a bit of a damp squid everywhere. But if we can keep some people on board and keep having those conversations, then the momentum does build and it then becomes more of a social norm. And actually what the science says is there's a big bunch of people that just like to not uh, miss out and to fit in. And actually if people around them, you know, if you've got 10 houses on your street and eight people do it, the next year, 10 people will do it because those two people don't want to be the odd people on the street. And, you know, that might not happen in every circumstance because some people might really love doing their garden short. But mm. there are there's quite a big portion of society that just likes to follow the social norm. And if we can get it up to a level where it is the social norm for things to be a bit more scruffy, then suddenly we get the, the snowball effect and it starts to work really well. A couple of ideas just quickly on the how to try and make it look less untidy for people that really like it tidy. If you've got a big area and you know that that area is used for other stuff, think about just mowing a path through it. Um, that can be something really simple that on a, on a grand scale, actually from a pollinator point of view, doesn't actually make that much difference if it's a mower width, gives people a desire line to follow and then you don't have that, oh, I used to walk my dog here and now I can't kind of situation. Uh, on, on the edge of it, another idea is to cut away the edge. So if you're mowing your own lawn and you want to make it look like you haven't just broken your lawnmower, you can cut away the edge down the side, which gives it a defined kind of area, and the rest of it is still long. And again, depending on how big your lawn is, that's often not a huge impact on the actual area that's benefiting pollinators, but just gives it that sense that it's being kind of looked after. And again, that could be something that can break down people's barriers around, you know, whether it's the right thing to do or not. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I was thinking, um, th th let's call up, th I don't want to be negative about people, but the, the biggest culprits were, um, I would say, retired men or, or men my age and older, let's say. And, it, and I think it's a strange psychological thing. People, you know, we're surrounded by chaos in the world and things that we have no um, influence on. And it's a bit scary. And people can imp impose their control and their will on their little patch. And it, that's a tricky mentality 
to um, to try and to try and uncultivate because um, yeah, they, I think they get a lot out of it. My my neighbours and I, I think I just need to talk to them more and you know just just keep on at them. And like you say, um, it's like Ian said, um, just leave. Try and mow some nice patches. Make attractive shapes for my, my back garden's got just weird patches and the, the grandchildren love to run through it and and chase each other through it so just try and be artistic and be creative with it but it is tricky i'll, I'll accept that it's tricky but, but maybe you know use, using this no mo may i know it's got a nice little tag i can't say it but it has i think we should do it in june because you get you get more um, well certainly into june anyway we'll get a bigger we'll get a bigger impact mm -hmm. There, there is a let it bloom June. Uh, so we left our front garden, um, no more May, let it bloom June. And I think there was a July one as well, but I don't know what that is. Um, but I, I, I think what uh, Ian was saying about uh, changing people's mentalities on this to make it more the norm, because completely different comparison, but you know, people didn't used to wear seat belts. But over time, they did. Um, there were a lot more when I was working. A lot of people had liquid lunches, and that was the norm. But over the over time, it became frowned upon that you know you you shouldn't be drinking quite rightly during the working day. So it's how do we change things? And yes, we can do it gradually. The problem is, is we don't have time. Um, Twenty thirty will soon be upon us, and you know, I struggle to know how to make things move even faster because there was um, guidance from central government that was meant to be going down to county councils about doing less mowing of verges. And yet I'm not really seeing much evidence that county councils are acting on. Some are and some are trialing areas, but it, it just doesn't seem fast enough. And how we can galvanize that i understand that county councils district councils they they do have difficulty in that if they get a few complaints they really want to back down quickly and yet people who complain have loud voices if you see something you like you may be less likely to write to the council and say this is great so maybe we need to ha somehow have a more positive campaign that we can drown out the complaints by having more people say positive things. <laughs> Tell me what you think about that. I like it. Yes, I'm, I agree. We uh, sometimes succumb to negative uh, negativity and forget that there are so many things to praise, and we just need to be vocal in praising them and uh, saying to people what we notice and what we like. And even if we just say it to our neighbors or say to people, passerbys and counsel us, then it makes it life better because I was notice things and I was start appreciating things. So yeah, I, I definitely agree with you here, Fern. So uh, talking about things, you know, that we need to act fast uh, because we don't really have that much time. There's a question from Janet Alty here. Uh, and in a sense, Rob I was asking a smaller question as well about it. What about guerrilla gardening and whether you can just declare certain things, uh, a no more zone, so some other zones. So what, what, is, it your, uh, what, what is your opinion on uh, guerrilla gardening and uh, things like that? Um, if I can jump in there. Effectively, uh, the whole Talisman Square project is a huge uh, piece of guerrilla gardening. Um, it was all just dust and tarmac, uh, and now it's uh, it's a lot more than that. It's it's um, it's it, it's it's a very naturalistic looking garden. Um, it is nothing more, nothing other than guerrilla gardening. So uh, we've definitely done it. Yeah, I um, Tasman Square does look great. It's got, gets lots of comments. Um, it would be really great if we could uh, encourage other residents 
to take over little bits of unloved parts of their town, of which there are plenty. I'm sure everybody knows somewhere at corner of a, of a car park that could do with some attention, but it's getting people to do that. And um, uh, people like myself and, and John, um, we already do a lot of volunteering and um, I daren't take on another project, um, but I would love it if, you know, people did approach me and say, well, what can we do? How did you do it? Um, and see if we can get people involved that way. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm all in favour of guerrilla gardening. Did you, not, sorry, sorry. did you not approach the, um, the owners of Talisman Square, John? Well, uh, Judy in the bookshop, she'd already started to do it a bit. And when we started to build the planters, uh, we did we did engage with them. We told them roughly what we plan to do. But we've always stretched that envelope a little bit more than they would have perhaps. Um, they essentially, from my from what I can gather, they want it to be a car park. I can't understand why anybody parks there when there's a free car park in Waitrose next door, but they they do people do like to park there. And um, but we will sneak a little bit more than we're allowed. Uh, we snuck a big island of tires in the middle. Um, and we just put a, we just, uh, we, one of us, um, kind of just drew it on some kind of application that nobody will look at. But now we've got a great big load of, a uh, big island full of, um, jazzy flowers in the middle of talisman square well so i'm a great admirer of it i think well, i think you've done extremely well there tremendous that's yeah, good fun it's been good fun it is good fun okay Ian, do you have anything to add here or? yeah i mean I, I would agree that you know the the biggest challenge around all of this, as Fern said a few minutes ago, is the urgency that's now required. You know, we are, as I showed in my my slides, we're failing. We're so far we're failing, and and quite depressing if you dwell on that too much. I mean, worked in the environmental sector now for two decades and enjoyed my job and feel like we are actually achieving quite a lot at a local level. We're still not hitting the scale that we need to. So something has to change, and I think the thing that changes the dynamic for me is if we make it relevant to more people so from the organization's point of view like a wildlife trust we have the ability to have a conversation at the decision maker level within local authorities and within businesses to try and influence them about how they change their behavioral changes around their mowing regimes around whether they spray things whether they allow guerrilla gardening in certain areas and, you know, their conversations that have been going on for a while and in certain areas we have more success than others. But we're starting to build a bit of a track record and a bit of a almost a peer rivalry where you can now point in the same way that if you get eight people out of 10 on a street to change, we can start to say, well, have you seen this local authority over there? They're doing stuff. Why are you not doing it for your residents? There's an economic case to doing this a lot often as well, which is a good thing <laughs> if they don't necessarily rate biodiversity. Uh, and there's the health and well-being situation as well around air quality, mental health, uh, physical health. So there's a lot of different levers that we can pull at a, a kind of an organisational level. But I think that alone isn't going to be enough. We're still going to need people to go on the ground and take positive action in their local area. And I think the more we can localise it, the less we rely on a few individuals and you know as Fern said there's plenty of people already really committed and doing lots of stuff we can't just rely on them to scale up as individuals because there's only so many hours in a day and you know, there's lots of stuff going on in people's lives so we've got to try and make it accessible so that everyone could do a little bit um, and sometimes that'll be in communal spaces or sometimes it'll be in their own area if they've got their own land and you know that could be a garden or it could be a farm or, or whatever else in between. Thank you. It actually ties in quite nicely with a comment from uh, Hazel Underwood, uh, who says with projects like HS2 causing so much destruction, uh, I find it difficult to not feel disheartened and that my small actions are meaningless. It's time to, uh, it's, it, it's hard uh, sometimes to keep going. So how do you guys keep going? How, how do you feel encouraged every Friday or every day, uh, keep going and do small things 
what what would you advise here? Um, back, back to guerrilla gardening, just to link into what you've just asked there, Ignati. Um, where I work, uh, there's about 11 acres of natural burial ground. And it's the time of year for the cut. So the, the guy who, the, f the former owner, who's still around and about, he, he would spray everything and, and cut everything to the bone. And the contractors, um, to begin with, my, I, I scythed about four swathes of burial lines, which is quite, quite an area. And my siding isn't that effective yet. I'm, not, I'm quite a novice. But I've left um, a fairly substantial sward of grass. And as I was siding, you can see the, the grasshoppers and, the, and the, the frogs. They're all hopping out of the way because they've got time. And then they got, the, the contractors arrive and they blitzed all of the meadow to like a billiard table. And, you know, they must have liquidized many frogs and, and, and creatures. Um, but I, I'm a great believer in um, seeking forgiveness rather than asking permission. So I've, I'm, I'm protecting these. Now, now that everything else has been cut, my four scythed little meadows look really scruffy compared to everything else, which has just been obliterated to uh, uniformity. Um, and I'm really getting my elbows out to the, the, the former owner and the new owner and saying, look, th this is a big deal to me. If you're going to, if you want to cut this, then I'm probably going to have to walk away from this. It, this is the kind of intrinsic level where just these four uh, meadows will have a huge impact. And it's not just, a, you know, carbon capture. For carbon capture to work, the plants need to have their foliage exposed to, to, to capture the carbon and put it into the ground. If you, if you don't have any foliage, you're not capturing any carbon whatsoever. That, that's a, I think that's a valid point. But yeah, definitely do what you want. Um, seek forgiveness and don't always ask permission. Good phrase, good, good approach. But how will you keep going? How will you find enough energy and motivation to do things when you see things happening, you know, people destroying your work, destroying what you believe in? And I don't think there's any choice. You've got to keep going. We've got to all get a bit stubborn about this and get our elbows out and, and be a little bit confrontational, but polite and, um, and engage with people and, and explain to them the urgency of the situation and yeah, find it, some energy that way. Yeah, if, if anything, it, it motivates me more because I was always in the background. Whatever I did, you know, um, previous jobs, I was always in the background, very rarely customer facing, um, would have avoid public speaking. Um, I think somehow being on Zoom makes it easier. I seem to have found my voice, uh, whereas before I never did. I would have been very daunted by this, but I think the fact that I'm mainly just seeing four faces somehow helps. Um, and like John, I, I, you know, I haven't been on demos since since I was a student, and yet I went on two HS2 marches, um, and um, I think seeing the number of other people who were there from all backgrounds, political opinions, whatever, um, you just have to keep going. And and I I know when I was doing the walks, it wasn't going to make any difference, but you just have to keep keep going um, and always try and see the positive in it and the small wins. I, I, and, and it's amazing how um, a few nice comments from passers-by on Salisbury Square, it does motivate you to keep going. Um, and, you know, I, I you know, we, even though, this talk is quite well attended. This, with this, is just a tiny percentage of people, and I do want to somehow get the message further 
And I think that's what frustrates me is, is how can we get more people involved? Just to, to quickly add to that, I mean, from my side of things, I think you really can't underestimate the power of positivity. And it's really important just to try and see the world through a, a glass half full. And that's not natural for everybody. And, you know, that's fine. Everybody's different. But actually, there's quite a lot of science behind it. And I do sort of follow the science in most stuff. There's quite a lot of science that says if you uh, ask people in a positive way, you know, HS2 is horrendous we can do something about it though, can't we? You get a positive answer. If you say HS2 is horrendous, it's gonna you know, be catastrophic for everything. You get a negative answer and that can perpetuate. And you know, I think it's, there's no denying that HS2 has been absolutely catastrophic for local wildlife. And the Wildlife Trust from the very outset has been campaigning for it to be done in a better way. And, and that has, you know, we've, we've lobbied government, we've, we've given scientific evidence that the committees None of that has been listened to, and you know we absolutely support the right for local people to protest. I think the 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 thing to try and hold on to is that actually, you know, if we keep making a positive statement of things can be done in a be in a better way, and offering that rather than just offering problems, offering solutions, then hopefully that changes behaviours. And that's the scale for HS2, but it's also the scale for uh, you know, a local council who maybe are not mowing their, their verges in the right way or something like that. I think that, you know, a lots of people and organisations get people complaining and moaning a lot. If we can try and turn that conversation around and offer solutions and positivity and the benefits of what nature brings to people as well as wildlife, then I believe that's the way to unlock in some of the, the potential that we need in terms of engaging more people because they're inspired by it then and want to be part of this exciting adventure that we're on um, and it's also it's showing solutions to councils or to businesses that are perhaps seeing barriers otherwise thank you talking about positivity uh, and positive stories Jonathan asks uh, Ian but I, I'm, I'm sure John and Fern will be able to contribute do you have any stories about any plant or animal species that have re-emerged in Warwick as a result of rewilding and biodiversity projects? Um, in one of our uh, areas that wasn't mowed, um, uh, one of the locals very happily contacted us to say that they had seen uh, a common orchid there, which was very nice. And um, I've forgotten the name of it now, but there was a, another flower that came up, which apparently only re-emerges on former meadowland. Um, so it is amazing how long some seeds will stay dormant in the ground. Um, so, you know, it's only the first year of the trial. So um, I'm taking all the small wins and, and hope for better again next year. Uh, more, more broadly, there's a, there's a couple of successes that are always nice to sort of relate to. So um, the, the, an animal that a lot of people know, the otter. So, you know, if we, we rewind the clock back to the 70s and 80s, when uh, agricultural chemicals and pollution from industry were decimating our rivers uh, and the, the natural habitat alongside rivers was m much more intensively managed than it is now in a lot of cases. Uh, War uh, Warwickshire had almost no otters and they were on the brink of extinction across the county. Um, we, we surveyed them extensively uh, throughout the, the 90s and the early 2000s and the survey volunteers that went out looking for them would occasionally find their poo and the odd footprint and it was quite a demoralising volunteer uh, operation really because you never really saw the animal uh, but people kept going out and kept recording them and over time the records have grown and grown and grown and now they're on every river back in Warwickshire and the sightings of them, you know, we get vi countless videos every year now of them in the middle of Leamington and other, other towns and cities across the patch where they're seemingly, you know, just getting going about their daily lives without being worried about the fact that somebody's watching them from a bridge, which is fantastic. And that's, that's a great one on a county scale. We've also had some really nice local wins working in partnership with communities and with farmers. Um, so, you know, farmers get a, a lot of bad press uh, for the impact that they have on nature. We've got a project called the Arden Farm Wildlife Network, um, which works with farmers across quite a large area in Warwickshire. 
and we got some funding through Tesco uh, bags of help from the carry bags to install barn owl boxes. And uh, we put 20 barn owl boxes up across farms across the whole area. And this year they were monitored for breeding success. And we had a fantastic uh, impact on there with barn owls bred right across the farm uh, network that we, we didn't have before. So some of the barn owls were extending their range uh, already present on the farm and breeding in existing boxes and the new ones we've put up uh, and other farms are having barn owls for the first time. So it shows, you know, on a scale on a local level, obviously that's a farmer with a barn owl box, but you can make a difference on your own patch, whether you've got a window box or a garden and, you know, working at a landscape scale when lots of people do it together, we can help a, a species at that level then, which is brilliant. Um, yeah, from where, where I work at Temple Baltal, which is not quite Warwickshire, it's just outside, uh, I saw a dog otter uh, feeding at the stick dams on the Warwickshire Wildlife Trust land, uh, area. And w I'm almost certain he was eating the uh, signal crayfish that abound there because um, we see them all the time. And in his sprint under the bridge, uh, you can see the sort of the ground up shell. Uh, so that was at work in Temple Balsall. I see kingfishers there a lot as well. Uh, but just over the, down the road from where I live, uh, Eldeen Road here, uh, on, onto Whitemore Road, there's a lovely bit of abandoned heath. I think the railway company owned it. It's next to the tip. It's the old brickworks. And there's bee orchids there. I haven't seen them this year, but last year was a wash with mar uh, marble white uh, butterflies. Uh, so it's just fantastic. And positive. Very positive. I think super. Thank you. Uh, Ian, there is one more question for you looking into the future, uh, present and future. Uh, uh, is Borussia Wildlife Trust involved in New World Common yet? And if so, what's the progress? Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, yes, we are. Um, new World Common is very much uh, in our radar for a potential new nature reserve. We've had conversations with the District Council about taking it on after it was no longer viable as a golf course, and we're waiting essentially for the council process to proceed to a point where uh, we can get more actively involved. We've commented on the designs that have been put forward so far, and we can see a role that the Nature Reserve could play alongside other new facilities for the local community that would be integrated in a way that would still give lots of space for nature. Um, we can see it as an amazing um, pilot project that would demonstrate a, a brilliant before and after transforming a golf course into a nature haven that still allowed it to be publicly accessible and for people to use it for a variety of different reasons, but a much more uh, uh, better value for, for wildlife and supporting nature's recovery. And for us, it's a great example of what we're trying to achieve with this new strategy, because it's right, obviously right next door to our Lem Valley and Welsh's Meadow Nature Reserve. Um, and that's the focus really for our land acquisition. So I mentioned we were trying to raise money to buy land. Um, we're also looking at where we can do land transfer, so we wouldn't be buying New Bowl Common, we'd be entering into an agreement with the council. Um, we're also talking to, to um, Coventry City Council about a site up near there as well, uh, and we've got a few other sort of ongoing discussions with other landowners. So as soon as we're in a position to um, start talking to the community and engaging them on what the future site might look like, um, you know, you guys will be the first to hear because key for the success on our side is to make sure that what is designed is done in partnership with local communities so that people uh, can input into the, the designs and the detail and, and feel ownership of it as it evolves and hopefully it'll be a great place for wildlife and people in the future. So yeah, fingers crossed, we're just waiting for the political process to work through. Fantastic. Okay. <laughs> Look forward to hearing more about it. A uh, question from Janet uh, Altis. Uh, does anyone know if there is a check on the snakes in the area? Uh, Janet says that she saw one swim across the canal a year or three back, but have seen none since. So anything? No. I'll just say quickly, so there is a, a Warwickshire amphibian and reptile team. So uh, a number of the different wildlife groups, whether they be uh, mammals or amphibians, reptiles or bats, have a, a local specialist interest group. Um, I mean, some of you may be members or, or familiar with them already. Um, they are primarily made up of local people that are just passionate about it. Some industry professionals who might be ecologists, but others who just really care about that species. So the Wildlife Trust as a charity supports those other independent 
independent groups by giving them venues to meet and, and things like that and help with training. Um, they do a lot of surveys across the county for amphibians and reptiles. It's not comprehensive because uh, they're all volunteers and, and there's a big area to cover. Um, we're fairly sure the last time I spoke to anybody from there, they're fairly sure that we'd have no more ad adders in the county. Um, the habitat's not the extent it needs to be for them. So grass snakes are still very prevalent and slow worms are. Um, and, you know, again, both of those species, people can help in their gardens or in the local park or in local areas. They're well found across most of the county. Uh, loads of slow worms down on the allotment in uh, Kenilworth. Uh, I think nearly everybody's composter has got slow worms in it. But if anyone ever wants to see uh, snakes, I, I read a, a tip and it worked to treat. Uh, uh, grass snakes should really be called water snakes. And um, I rented, I, I was, the book suggested, if you go on a river after, a, after rainfall, you, you're likely to see snakes. And I rented um, a rowing boat from the Lem boat hire place and just rowed up and we saw, we saw quite a few. It was, it was brilliant. Super, thank you. Well, I think it's time for us to wrap up now and it's great that we're actually finishing on a positive note, you know, with otters being seen and snakes being seen and all sorts of things. And uh, quite a few thanks uh, for inspiring stories in the chat. Uh, question from Rob, and some people already started answering him, but maybe we can uh, name some people uh, for us all to contact tomorrow to voice our positive support for diversity measures in our localities. So whom can we contact in the councils, but maybe wider than that? Just to, from, from my side, um, this is another area that we're very keen to help support people with, to signpost who the right people are to talk to. And we'll be doing a lot more of that next year. So a lot of the stuff I've talked about tonight with the sort of Team Wilder idea and empowering and supporting people to do more will really come to fruition in 2022 when we start releasing uh, guides and, and uh, videos and things on online and leaflets to, to explain to people how to make an impact. And that could be through... Um, making a bird box in their garden or making a wildflower patch or contacting the local MP or local people within the council. Um, so there are, there are definitely MPs that it's worth writing to and explaining the importance of it. They can have a sway. Uh, a number of Lord Mayors in the area are very uh, into the environment. And then there's local contacts like John Holmes. We work really closely with John Holmes from Warwick District on our nature reserves that we manage on behalf of Warwick District Council. He's very good. Um, so, yeah, we would encourage you to, to voice your opinion to the councils in a positive way. As Fern said earlier, you know, people that moan tend to, to shout loudly and, and people that are happy tend to, to not say too much. Um, so it's always good to, to promote positivity around the environment. Um, what I would say as well is if anybody's interested in finding out more from the Wildlife Trust, uh, I'll stick my email in the chat in a minute. I can um, I can. Uh, sort of put you on a list and we can send you some more information when we have some more information about these new ideas that we're going to come forward to to support local people either individuals or groups um, <laughs> like I say the majority of that info will probably come out after Christmas but if you're happy to be contacted um, you can always opt out afterwards then we can send you an email with some further info nearer the time. Um, can I just say before we go the the um despite the fact I've got loads of irons in fires at the moment, the thing that I'd like to get involved with next is having better communication between all the local groups. Um, because in Kenilworth, and I'm sure it's the same in Warwick and Leamington, we have lots of overlapping groups doing similar things. And it'd be really nice if we could have some central way of having uh, contact with all the groups that we keep in communication so that if we're doing something and maybe you know we just need people to come for one afternoon to do something as a one-off we can send it out to all the groups and say oh is anybody free to help with whatever it is um because quite often when we're out volunteering you do have people asking us about it and they'll say oh yeah but i can't do it every week and so i think it'd be really nice if we could find some way of of whenever any of us are doing anything of keeping everybody in the loop. 
Thank you. I think uh, Hazel just put in the chat that Warwickshire Climate Alliance aims to bring all green groups together. Mm -hmm. So maybe they're working much wider than uh, just volunteering groups, but probably, yeah, it's a good platform uh, to, to start from. Fantastic. So thank you, Ian, for, for putting your email address uh, uh, into the chat and also the website uh, for donations, uh, which is uh, great. So we have quite a few email addresses in the chat at the moment, uh, both uh, county councillors and district councillors, but also officers uh, at the district council and uh, also email, uh, Ian's email uh, for signposting. So that's great. So it's definitely something for us to all to consider and spread positivity, spread the message that things are happening that they can be and it should really escalate and they should really uh, accelerate rather uh, and happen wider and faster. Uh, but we can all come from the point that as individuals and as organizations, we have the power to change things. There are bad things happening and we should take note of them and uh, Vo uh, voice our opinions on them and uh, say that we uh, are not happy with them. And yet there are plenty of things we can all do, be it in our back garden or front garden so that others can see. Uh, and perhaps with some uh, guerrilla actions uh, go further than our own gardens. And three things which I want to take from today and I hope that others would agree that they can be useful that volunteering and working on, on, on biodiversity can be a social thing, can be a pleasant thing and it should really be a pleasant and uh, social thing and the examples uh, John and Fern gave of them spending their Friday in an alternative way and uh, then sharing a glass of wine and stories and probably chat and having fun it's a good example of what uh, can happen, be it with your neighbors or with people you've never seen before. Uh, spreading positivity, as I said, and then changing behavior, changing people's behavior to ensure that uh, through communication, people understand what's happening and what should happen and uh, making them change their habits, small habits to start with and offering solutions, uh, offering solutions to problems through actions, through communication, again, through uh, talking to uh, people you know or people you might want to, uh, to know. And the phrase which I really loved today, and I think it will be a good phrase for us all to sleep on, uh, is uh, asking forgiveness, not permission. Because if you know that you're doing the right thing, you just have to keep going and then ask forgiveness if need be. Hopefully if soon we will not need to ask for forgiveness. <laughs> People will understand what, where we are coming from. So thank you very much, uh, Fern, John, Ian, for your uh, contribution tonight. I think it was a very, very positive and very inspiring conversation. Lots of stories and lots of projects uh, we can learn from and we can take to the next level. So this recording will appear on our YouTube and hopefully more people will see it and will get uh, inspired by it. So thank you very much and enjoy your uh, evening, whatever is left of it. Thank you. Bye.